I will not be pushed, filed, stamped, indexed, briefed, debriefed, or numbered. Welcome, everybody, to The Village Idiots, our podcast devoted to all things The Prisoner. I am your host, Taylor Trask. And I am Charles Wefso. And we're here. Uh, this is a brand new show, actually. We, we uh, will get into why we're doing this in just a second. Um, but for those of you who are brand new to us, to the podcast, to the show, The Prisoner, let's just, I guess, start by introducing ourselves. Charles, tell, tell the folks about you. Um, I'm Charles Wefso. I'm a writer who lives in Denver, Colorado. I host the Hardy Boys Drink Book podcast, and I write for a web series called At Any Rate. Both excellent, excellent pieces. Great, thanks. Um, I also live in Denver. Um, I do a variety of things. I run a digital agency. I do some little film projects on the side. I also host a show called Coffee and Comics Club um, that you might find on this network too, along with the Hardy Boys Drinkcast. And um, yeah, Charles and I have been trying to find a way to do a show together for a little while. And one day recently, I hit him up on Google Instant Messenger and I said, hey man, did you know that The Prisoner, the original 1960s series is now on Amazon Prime? Prime. That could be really fun. And and barely any time passed when you said, oh, my God, I love this show. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I'm I think that the last time I had watched before it went up on Amazon Prime, um, I like as always happens with The Prisoner, I mentioned it and then discovered that my wife had no idea what I was talking about. What? This was maybe like four years ago. Um, and so I immediately downloaded it from somewhere and we watched all of it. And um, I had only seen a handful of episodes before that and then watched it all again and learned a ton about it and got very obsessed with it. Um, So this has been incredibly fun since it's been back up on Amazon. Um, Just watching the episodes we remember the best. Um, Also just realizing how much we forgot when we like marathoned it, Mm -hmm. uh, how much we missed. But uh, yeah, so how did you discover The Prisoner? Was this the first time you've seen these? Okay, so my relationship with the show goes back to 2009 when AMC did this reboot with Ian McKellen and Jim Caviezel. And I remember seeing that and it was like, this is like, early Breaking Bad AMC. So they mm-hmm. were just still, you know, scra- stretching their creative wings and doing all these risky, cool things. And I remember really liking that series. I, I bought it on iTunes. I'm like, I really, I, there's something going on here I really like. I knew there was an, an original series that it was sort of loosely based on. And I had, I had tried to grab the episodes, but they were very unavailable at that time. I think yes, AMC, hard to find. AMC had put them on, on DVD, but then I didn't really mm-hmm. want, I wasn't really into buying DVDs and stuff. And then it, kind of was on streaming and then I was just like at some point it's going to be on Netflix or it's going to be on Amazon I'm just going to wait and sure enough it popped up um uh, you know a week or two ago and I was like oh my god I gotta start so I started basically streamlining the entire thing realized that you kind of need to take your time a little bit with this show so I kind of pulled back but let's pull back even further I guess there's gonna be people listening who don't even know what this show is and Each episode of this podcast, we're going to dive into it. We're not just going to review the episodes. We're going to dive into the the psychology of of each episode. We're going to try to help you kind of understand the themes and metaphors. Um, So we're going to get into all that. But I guess give the folks at home, Charles, a a glimpse as to what this show is. Like Try to summarize it if you can. Elevator pitch me. Uh, Yeah, so the uh, show was created in 1967, um, was when most of the episodes were filmed. It aired... um in 1968, originally in England and Canada. It, the basic premise of the show is about as simple as uh, you can get for a spy thriller. Mm-hmm. A uh, super spy goes into a government office and resigns his commission, and storms out, goes to his house, is gassed, and wakes up in an idyllic village from which he cannot escape. Mm-hmm. And the premise of each episode is loosely structured around the concept of our main character, who is referred to as number six, as all of the people in the village are referred to by numbers instead of names, um, and number six attempts to escape the village. Mm-hmm. That's it. And part of the reason why I think the show was was so effective um, originally was because the, and why it challenged so many expectations of the audience, was because the actor who, uh, Patrick McGowan, who created The Prisoner 
and stars in it and directed many episodes and wrote, I think, seven of the he 17 was like, episodes. He was the showrunner for all intents and yes, purposes. He, um, he was definitely the, the single unified consciousness behind the project. Um, imagine, he, imagine if Brian Cranston also wrote all the Breaking Bads and directed yeah. them. Like, it's kind of like, it'd be at that level, like, oh my God. Yeah. And so he, um, before he had done, um, before he had done The Village, Patrick McGowan played um, a character named John Blake. Mm. I think that that was his name. I'd have to look that I'll up. I'll start looking like um, Yeah. And he was the, Drake. Sorry, it's Drake. Um, and he played a character who uh, was a super spy, a la James Bond or um, The Saint, Mm -hmm. one of those classic British characters. There was a big, you know, tons of spy fiction in the 1960s. And he played for four years a character who was on a show called Danger Man, which aired in the United States under Secret Agent, which the song song that all Americans know, Secret Agent Man, was Uh, the theme to that show. Cool. So when when audiences first saw that, one, he was starring as a spy in this new show, they immediately projected the character of John Drake onto him even mm-hmm. i mean he's playing a very similar character mm-hmm. and um i th- i think it was the expectation that this was a continuation of danger man that allowed him to like start with an audience and then challenge them drastically with every single yes. episode i think drastically is is even underplaying it like he, let's set the stage imagine you're in you know the late 60s in london and nothing has really existed to challenge you in this way before this is this is twin peaks 20 plus years that's before that's the thing that I, yeah i most you know? often hear it compared to and it's like and before long before twin peaks came out like a lot of people point to twin peaks as kind of like the the genesis point for tv as we know it today like that was the show that really pushed boundaries and in america yes as like an american produced project yes but the prisoner was way before the that and i think even more influential than people give it credit for even now it's revered but i think it's even more influential than people even want to know like it was the first time like true surrealism was put on the tv on the tv on a weekly basis on Um, a weekly basis yeah. yeah i mean people obviously there had already been huge um huge reactions publicly to the works of george orwell which were you know structured as as narratives but were heavily allegorical and you know like obviously orwellian is a term that we're probably going to use too often yeah when it comes to the prisoner um and it's the same thing with kafka which is the other thing that the show is most often uh compared to but yeah like you said in television there had been there had been nothing i mean the closest thing i can think in film would have been something like out of art house cinema in the like Unshin Andalou or, or like whatever. Jodorowsky, like Holy Mountain or something yeah, like that. Yeah, like maybe. just, yeah, that that level of just bizarreness. And, and I think that's a big thing that you can watch this show as a traditional narrative. Mm-hmm. You, you can, and that's how I personally choose to watch the show. Okay. Um, and I know you and I have talked a little bit about that, about how um, y- you can see every single bit of metaphor in the show and try mm-hmm. to see like what is the allegory I'm being told or you can just watch it as a spy trying to escape mm-hmm. and it's quite a lot of fun either way like I uh, I, I don't know how do you how do you perceive the metaphor so here's the here's the tricky wicket with this show like you start watching it and if you watch it literally you're gonna be really frustrated for a while because two things kind of are at play one the production style of the time is still a little wonky like there's a lot of edits that you're like ooh, like it's just like edit 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 edit, just kind of like and some of it's narratively driven or stylistically driven but a lot of it's just like kind of lazy choppy editing you're not and again product of the time so you kind of forgive it a little bit but the other thing too is there will be details that they'll just gloss right over for no reason and it's like and it's more if you watch it literally it will infuriate you because you're like well but that what about that or what about that guy or you know cast members will just disappear and reappear without any explanation and it occurred to me about eh, maybe halfway through the second episode i watched i'm like oh this whole thing is one giant metaphor right and it's it's a metaphor on a couple different levels it's one for the idea of individualism versus collectivism Um, yes that's a big overarching theme of the of the show you know, it's, I think it's the biggest idea. Of yeah, the and they do great, uh, well executing that. We'll get into the the kind of the nuts and bolts as, uh, as we go. Pardon me, I'm gonna turn my mic a little bit. There we go. Yeah. Um, 
But it's also a metaphor for just Patrick McGowan's state of mind at any given time. You right. know, he was rebel. to your point, he was rebelling a little bit from the cliches that have been foisted upon him as an actor, as a director, right. as a creator. Um, you know, and he's, as the episodes kind of progress, they sort of mirror what his frame of mind is, you know, for better or for worse. It's also a metaphor, though, just for, you know, like it, it's, it's really interesting. I found it in 2018 because I think even more than ever, there are things that we're dealing with in society and in culture that are much more more the, the critique on those things is much more pointed now than it maybe would have been in the late 60s yeah the, the the fact that we live in a time where we have a performative every single person has a performative aspect of their personality that isn't just like to the people you interact with on a daily basis but you're expected to almost be maintaining a brand yeah. that you're selling yes. with social media i am um, i like especially this most recent rewatch I keep getting hit on all of these. I mean, the there's a repeated uh, exchange during the opening sequence of the show. Mm -hmm. And he asks number two, who is the managerial presence of the village where mm -hmm. he's trapped. Usually number two is the point of uh, authority and communication with authority that number six has through the mm -hmm. show. And so in the conversation or the exchange with number two between number two and number six that plays in the opening sequence he asks him uh what do you want and they just say information mm -hmm. and then they hit that point home by saying information three more times so yeah i just feel like in this era where providing information you know about yourself and what you do and mm -hmm. who you speak to and what you know and all those things is like your most valuable thing yeah. It's the thing that's being bought and sold right now. Yeah. And so, you know, it's just it's really fascinating to watch this show where collectivism is is inescapable, inescapable. And now it feels like that's exactly how it is. You know, yeah. Where and just systems in general, like there's a lot of systems and some of them seem useful and some of them are purely mundane and some of them are, are invented for the reason of tricking number six or keeping him at bay. It's it's really hard to tell sometimes. The big reason I watch the show, and I know we've talked about this offline a little bit, like, you know, do you watch it literally? Do you watch it as metaphors or a happy medium? Yeah. I choose to watch it almost purely as metaphor. And the biggest reason, other than some of the, you know, a lot of the details kind of being flubbed over on that note, by the way, it is the opposite, and I hate to use this reference for the 90th time in something, but like it is the opposite of Lost. Lost should have operated as pure metaphor because the ending would have made more sense. Yes. They would have had a lot more breathing room to tell their story, but they, they made such a big deal of all the details matter. Every little thing matters. And they didn't have a plan. And they didn't have a plan. And then they d decided in the very last 11th hour to skew into pure metaphor. And it's like, well, no, that you can't. No, you have to build that from the ground up. And that's, that's a lot of what, um, a lot of what the show does. I think a good place actually to jump into that would just be talking about the, um, the opening sequence. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. So Which by the way is is repeated in every episode. I think in the very yeah, in some, the pilot it's a little longer. There there is no uh opening sequence in the pilot. Oh. The pilot is um because all of those scenes that you see are um the actual scenes. They're not set to the um, That's right. with a musical score and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um the pilot or the opening sequence in the other episodes just sort of re recount the events of the pilot. Um but yeah, it's a it's quite a long opening. Yeah. Um I'm I know that shows used to have, you know, much longer opening sequences, but it's long enough that like I personally see it as an important part of watching an episode of The Prisoner is mm. to watch that opening sequence. Mm -hmm. Um the uh my wife does not agree. Mm. My wife will immediately be like, It's so long <laughs> and we'll skip it. Um but I, I don't know. It's for me it's really important. I also really like um the exchange with number yeah. with number two. So yeah. the opening shot of the opening sequence of the prisoner is the clear blue sky with a mm -hmm. couple of fluffy white clouds. And then there is the sound of thunder mm -hmm. that transitions into the sound of a jet air, like a jet engine. Yeah. Yeah. And then from a long distance down a long road in the middle of the country, we see Patrick McGowan in a tiny little kit sports car mm -hmm. racing towards the camera. Um, then he he's in the suddenly from the country mm -hmm. in the middle of of London, mm -hmm. um, in intense traffic, driving by the Parliament Building. Mm -hmm. He goes to his apartment, which I cannot remember the the address. It's like one Buckingham. It should be as important as twenty one or the as Baker Street, but we'll, yeah, we'll or like that. apartment number forty two for those X Files fans. Ooh, um, that's always that's. Mulder's apartment. Number. Buckingham, one Buckingham Place. One Buckingham Place, um, which is, I think, currently like a bank or something. Oh. Like um, 
or an administrative building. Anyway, so he he uh, when he gets to the parliament building, I forgot I forgot that part of it. Yeah, so he pulls in. He suddenly in the middle of town. He drives past the parlor, the parliament building. He drives down a slope. Mm-hmm. He opens a set of double doors that are labeled way out. Mm-hmm. Uh, walks down a long, oddly dark and severely lit hallway where the light sort of pulses on his face. Mm-hmm. It's a really interesting effect. Um, and then he storms into the office of um, a person who appears to be a superior in the spy agency. The actor there is the um, is Mark Stern, Mark Markstein, the the guy who co-wrote the show. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'd have to remember the actor's name because I want to get that right. I like to get actors' names right. It's important. We'll probably reference it a couple more times, I'm yeah. sure. But yeah, he walks in. We're watching. We've got the intro on in the background while you look it up. He walks in. He slams his fist, fist down and he resigns. And there's some dialogue exchange that we don't... Do we hear the dialogue no, exchange? No, it's just the sound of thunder. Okay. When he opens the door, it's thunder again. And when mm-hmm. he bangs his fist on the table, it's thunder. But he's he's irate and the... The letter that he's dropping off says by hand, private dash personal dash yeah. by hand. Yeah. Um, and so he gives him his resignation letter. Then there's some sort of automated filing system that files him as resigned yeah. as he drives his little kick car home. And he's being followed by a hearse, mm-hmm. which is the mo- which I find incredible. Like, I'm interested to talk about the symbolism of that. But he goes into his home, closes the door, and an undertaker or a man dressed as an undertaker gets out of the car casually walks up casually like sashay is up that's that's the part yeah. like, right there like, like just kind of like okay leaves the door of his car open um yeah he the white fog sprays into the apartment through the keyhole patrick mcguin se- realizes when the city starts to tip and spin around him that he's been drugged mm-hmm. he faints and when he awakes or when he wakes up He's in a very similar apartment. One of the strange things about it is that all of the furnishings, it's a different building, yeah. but all of the furnishings and pictures and everything from his old apartment. It's funny you mention that because the first time I watched this, I had to pause it and rewind it to go, is it the same physical structure or not? Because the, yeah, the furnishings kind of threw me off. Yeah, like there's a tiger skin rug. There's a statue of a, there's like a brown statue of a Buddha. There's like very strange stuff around. Mm-hmm. Um, so he opens the windows and he looks out and it's a beautiful seaside resort. looks like there's a, it's clearly a British coastal resort that's styled to look Italian. Yeah. Um, and there's nobody outside that he can see. And then it transitions to a room that we'll see a lot throughout the show, which is sort of the headquarters, like nexus of number two and the controlling apparatus of the village. And it looks like a set, a set from Star Trek yeah. from the original series. V- very different in aesthetic. Yeah, everything else before this has been super spies and this village and the room that number two's chair is in, which is a round, a like half circle chair, mm-hmm. um, sort of like if you remember the first Men in Black movie, yeah. they yeah, make yeah, yeah. they make Will Smith sit in that chair to take the test and he pulls the table. He, it's, it's one of those chairs. That's a great reference. And, uh, and then, yeah, and the room that you see of his, the like they just showed another shot of it. Um, after most of the shots from this, after he's in the village are of Patrick McGowan running on the beach. Um, but once you're in this sort of number two world, there's also this odd gyro thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where it's two men sitting on either end of a rotating, like <laughs> mechanical teeter totter thing. Yeah, yeah. They're facing away from each other and they're both looking into what look like microscopes or cameras or something. Mm-hmm. And it's clearly like the idea of surveillance without anything particular. Yeah. Which is crazy because think about it. We have to always think about the time and the place this was made. And there's yeah. so many universal themes. You kind of forget that. But the aesthetic is very late 60s until you get to like some of the more sci-fi elements. Oh, yeah. It's um, it's sort of like the more um, like Moonraker. Yeah. You know, like the sci-fi, the more sci-fi uh elements of a James Bond movie. Yes. They lean yeah. more heavily into that with the sci-fi. Um, yeah. And that stuff, you know. There's the the last aspect before we move on from of the opening is this exchange that I was talking about earlier between number six and number two. And the exchange goes, I'm going to try to do this from memory. It's where am I? Mm-hmm. You are in the village. Who? Uh, what do you want? Information. Information. Who are you working for? That would be telling. Mm-hmm. 
And then he says, who are you? I am number two. Who is number one? You are number six. Mm-hmm. And uh, right. and then uh, and then I, oh man, I don't remember what it is after you are number six. Is that the end of it? That's the end of it. He's like, um, I'm not a number. I am I'm not a, a man. number. I'm a man. And then the laughter. Um, and every time I listen to that, I think it means something different. I'm so glad you said that because I have been reflecting on the cyclical nature of watching that intro before each episode mainly because it's the it's the primary way they reveal the next actor who plays number two in that episode when the the chair rotates around you see the number two and something that we'll get into and we'll get into much more heavily throughout the series is that number two the actor who plays number two changes Mm -hmm. Throughout the series, it's yeah. not always a different actor, but it's most most often it's most a different often. actor in every episode. And it's usually like a, he- a heavy hitting British actor that's yeah. like of the time that was like oh like if this was today it would be Colin Firth and Ian McKellen and Emma Watson and like all the you know or Emma Thompson Emma I mean, Thompson. Thompson yeah yeah I know what you mean. Um, but yeah, yeah but maybe but yeah. maybe or like yeah. you, David Tennant like it would oh, be I that know. level of actor every time. So imagine that in the late sixties and you just like for me that's another huge appeal of the show. And again, like you said, we'll get into to that yeah. but just this idea of this authoritarian character that that position always remains but the person who fills it is always different and based they, on and they act different and they have different motivations yeah. and like some are driven clearly by fear and some are clearly excited about their work and some are clearly just resigned to what they're having to do yeah yeah and uh it's a great narrative device too because as one of the things I didn't and I'll, I'll try not to talk too much about the reboot series while we're talking about the original one. We may do the reboot series later on. Sure, yeah. I've, I've never seen any of it. And like I it's said, I didn't know that it exists or I learned about it and blacked it out because I didn't want anything to do with I it. I can't wait. To, I, I want to watch it with you because after knowing how you feel about this show, mm-hmm. I can't wait to hear your thoughts about the reboot. But one of the things that in hindsight I wish they had done, Ian McKellen plays number two the entire time. Right. And He's great. He's wonderful. But how much more powerful would that show have been if the very next episode, it was just some different actor sitting in the costume? It's like, <gasps> and I think the original series, you, you play with that. So as Patrick McGowan, as number six is trying to get out, as they're trying these different plot, you know, these plots, not only is he trying to outwit them or outmaneuver them, but he's also trying to deal with a totally new personality that's, you know, different from the last one. And he's got to adjust his strategy to, to, to deal yeah, with that. And, and this show is... Uh, it is surreal and it is sci-fi um, on on a certain level, but it's not the sort of thing like Doctor Who where the actor changes, but everybody accepts that it's the same person. Yeah, this yeah. is a different person who has now taken over the role of number two. Yeah, um, I like that also as a theme uh, thematically because, like you said, the whoever like the figure of authority can change, and they're driving, you know, uh, wants are the same. They want information. Yeah, the. Um, the other thing that I really like about it is that um, the it shows that there is a um, there's an impermanence yep. to their job, yep. and that it, it inherently instills them with drive to get to accomplish their goal as a character, mm. because you know that they might lose their commission and they might no longer be number two. Mm-hmm. And I think that the fact that we see what happens when a low level spy resigns. He gets secreted away. Do to we the know village. that he's low level? Well, I'm just saying compared to the people, the numbered people oh, running a thing like the village. So yeah, what yeah. would happen to a person who was that high up in an organization mm-hmm. who who failed? You know, like yeah. will they be retired to the village of their own? Mm-hmm. Will they be executed? Will, you know, um Which is important. Let's let's break too, because it's important to know, as far as I understand it, Everybody in the village is not there specifically for number six's own amusement or torment. Yeah, it's not the Truman Show. No, they've there's some elements of that, but a lot of the people in the village were brought there under the same circumstances, right? And have just learned to just live with it, to settle into society, to just become a number. And it's a little eerie when you think about that. And and you can you can tell you think which characters those are because they react with such fear yeah when he tries to get them to talk about anything outside the village they act with with panic but some of the characters that pull that off the most effectively are the aren't you know they are just as against the prisoner as as uh the rest of the structure and you yeah. can never tell they you can never tell if it's this person was acting and is actually working for the <clears throat> you know, is actually working for number two or 
this person is just as scared, but they know that they'll be killed if they don't do what they're told. You know, like you, you can, it's hard to gauge anyone else's motivation, no matter how they act, because it's a system. It's yeah. not about individual people. And so one of the mistakes that he makes the most frequently that I think in his situation I would make as well is he continually tries to connect with people's humanity yeah. and form a connection that's stronger than their than their obligation to the village or their connection to the village, which is also so profound in 2018. I know. Like, oh, that's that. I almost got chills hearing you say that because think about how many people you see have these horrible like political discussions online or whatever it might be and they're sort of like the they're systematized to do that and it's like but you're just regular people just yeah. there's common cause here and, and it just that like, gets all thrown away and you can desperately desperately try to form a personal connection to a person <clears throat> that's Sorry. behind that's right that's behind their uh that's that's stronger than their connection to an idea or something like that. But we have all encountered that where you think that you have formed that connection and then yeah. the other person let like lets you down or you let yourself down and you realize that you're like, no, my my uh, attachment to this ideal is stronger than my attachment to you as a person. And and seeing that um that come back and get him again and again and again or his desperate desire to form a connection to a person and use that for yeah. freedom. And they're like, no, there isn't, that doesn't exist. You yeah. know, you're still in the system. It makes you wonder how many of them tried and failed themselves and were just like, and so they, their resistance to him is almost like, dude, we, they, yeah. they never articulate this until the very end. But, um, you always wonder like how many, like how many versions of the show existed before him and all these people just are still there. Yeah. And, and learned and learned their lesson. Yeah. Um, and yeah. learned that it's not worth it and to just stay quiet and keep your head down and don't look at the guy who's freaking out. Cause they'll just come and get him. The, um, in the pilot episode with our first introduction to one of the most culturally iconic aspects of the show, which is a character called Rover mm -hmm. and Rover is a large white inflatable ball mm -hmm. that changes, uh, size and, um, at will, it seems like, mm -hmm. but it's usually about um, five feet in diameter. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit shorter than a person. You see it represented in a lot of stills and pictures and DVD covers and stuff. You see that big white ball. That's what yeah. we're talking about. And um, I think the Simpsons have a have a very like heavy prisoner reference episode oh, yeah. um, that a lot of people like. But but Rover um, Rover is. I, be, I see Rover as purely symbolic and um, part of the way that like you are the way the scene where you are introduced to Rover, um, a character in the middle of the crowded uh, village square where everyone is having a good time, has a panic attack and mm -hmm. suddenly seems to snap out of it yeah. or uh, have a moment of clarity where he realizes that he is um, that he that he is in that he's trapped yeah. and begins to freak out and begins to think that he needs to escape. And Rover appears um, first as a tiny ball that's floating on top of the water fountain mm -hmm. and then perspective shifts so that the ball is the same size, but it is now farther away and much larger mm -hmm. and it rolls into frame and pins the man to the ground. And it's made of like a latex blue. I mean, they're, they're, weather balloons they're yeah. meteorological balloons yeah and they pin the man down and seal you know they look it looks like it's suffocating him and then he's gone and then later you see him again in the village just fine totally readjusted yeah and um and you, whenever patrick McGowan tries to escape the thing that usually catches him and drags him back is this giant inflatable amorphous blob. Yeah. Um, Which is funny because like he'll he'll beat down five cronies and, you know, they've got trucks and stuff and he'll escape them all and then Rover will come in. So there's nothing he can do. You have the shot from uh, Free For All Up right now. And I think this is actually one of the best scenes when it comes to Rover because um, – he is swimming. He ha he is not exhausted. He hasn't been swimming for a long time. But the closer that Rover gets to him, the more visibly exhausted he is. Mm. And that happens throughout the series where just the presence of this thing saps people of their will mm -hmm. and makes you more complacent and less. And, and I mean, it touches you and you go rigid and scream until suddenly you're awake in the, in the hospital. This is something that comes to mind. And one of the, going back to kind of why, how we watch the show. One of the reasons I have to kind of stand firmly on the side of this being pure symbolism or pure metaphor 
what they're ultimately after from him is conformity, like yeah. on, a, on a thematic level. But what in the in the narrative, they they want to know why did you quit? Why did you quit? And and sometimes some episodes that's played a lot more heavy handed than others. And so you're watching, going, okay. And, and if you just think about it, like you know, a, a literal story that this is happening, these people found a way to not only build this village, they build Rover, they figured out a way to to kind of do this mass hypnosis and, and on, on the people. Yet they can't deduce why he would resign. Like it seems such an innocuous thing for them to not know given all their other expertise and, and you know, all the stuff they've got. So just that, that friction for me makes me go, well, it's gotta be all symbolic at the end of the day. Sure. Like if you think about it more literally, it's, it's I, just kind of um, you know. the, and obviously I, I agree with all of the metaphorical elements of it. I actually tend to think of the show and I, I like, I watch the narrative literally. Mm-hmm. That's, that's more what I'm saying. I'm not trying to take oh, okay. the, take the events of the show as things that actually happen, but I watch um, the show as close to, from the perspective of number six as possible. He tries to react to things as logically as he can. Mm-hmm. And I think of it more as like, um, like when you have a dream that you remember, dream logic is something that, that, comes up to me all the time when I'm watching The Prisoner, that there are things that you would do in a dream because they would make sense. Oh, sure. Um, And sometimes they pan out in a dream. But when you have a dream where you say, you know, I was at a party and a man showed up and I was being chased. And so I decided I was going to run to the top floor and get out on the roof. And you're like, and those things make sense. But then once I was on the roof, eventually I was in the woods yeah. and we were still being chased. And like the narrative made sense in the dream and you were following it and you were reacting to the events of it, though the reality wasn't reacting properly you know, to what's going on. Rover is one of the best examples for that of me is that Rover, um, I think, just represents paranoia mm. and fear. Every time that he starts to get, it, it doesn't even need to be released often. There's um, that shot that's right there on your screen right now of the mm-hmm. helicopter where he knows there's a helicopter and he has a key card that he can get in to fly it. Mm-hmm. And he knows that he can escape. And he doesn't, um, as soon as he begins to approach the helicopter, Rover is there. Mm-hmm. And Rover doesn't stop him. But it gets close to him and it circles him and he has to avoid it. And it's clear that like, to me, it it made it clear that that's just his panic and fear of like, okay, I'm about to do something, you know, Mm -hmm. um, so incredibly dangerous I might die. And Rover is the thing being like, no, stop, go back to the village, conform, Mm -hmm. just Mm -hmm. conform. Um, There's another, there's an episode that's all about dream manipulation um, oh, no, no. Actually, I am thinking of free for all as well. The one with the election mm-hmm. where as he's on the run, he enters a room that he had been in previously in the episode. And the room is clearly the same cave that he had been in, but it's now totally redesigned. And the only thing in the room is four men sitting around Rover staring at it. And then oh, they stand right. up and they grab him yeah. and it's just waiting there. And as soon as he goes in the room and realizes he's trapped, there's Rover. Yeah. There's the fear and he can't do anything. That's you know? right. Um, let me ask you this, because one of the big questions, even people who have seen it or who have you know maybe glanced at an episode or two that I get and need the question I had, is this, um, in the original 19, 1960s series, is this a dream in this guy's head? Is this a real event that's happened to him? Is like, And, and there's not necessarily a right answer to that question, but I, I think if you were to tell somebody fresh off the boat, like, hey, here's the prisoner, here's how you should probably start thinking about it, and if you evolve it, great. But like, would you tell them to watch it like a, you know, like, hey, it's a spy, it's an actual story that's happening to this guy as a spy with some surreal elements, or do you say, hey, you know, this is all a dream in his head, maybe? I mean, like... Yeah, I, I don't know. I, um... I probably would tell somebody to watch it as literally as possible when they first watch it. Okay. Um, I think part of the confusion, um, we, and we talked about this before we hit record, is the order in which you watch the episodes. Mm. I feel like when you watch them in the production order. Well, wait, clarify that real quick because okay. there's going to be people who so don't know what are, we're talking about. Yeah, so there are um, multiple different uh, orders that the show can be watched in, uh, the episodes of the show. It was not aired in the same sequence that it was produced. Mm-hmm. So the second episode that was aired on British television is the 11th episode that the that the crew made. Mm-hmm. Um, because of that, and because I, um, despite his reluctance to really lean into, it, it's so funny when you listen to an interview with Patrick McGowan, um, if you ask him about a specific, 
he seems to say that was a happy accident. Mm -hmm. And if you ask, if you say, was this an accident? He says everything was planned out. So it's like, you know, it's this frustrating thing where um, to me, he pitched this as a seven episode show. Okay. Um, and then they said, no, let's do 20. And he was able to, he was able to, he's like, I cannot sustain this premise wow. for 20 episodes. Which is hilarious because British television is notoriously known for being nice and compact and short now. So yeah, it's funny to like, hear the I back then. I, I'm pretty sure seasons of Are You Being Served are, well, uh, are 22 good. episodes. But that was know. back in the 60s. So like that was when uh, they hadn't quite figured that out yet for yeah. themselves, you know? Uh, so they... Uh, so he and his writers over the course of 48 hours, the other writers that he worked on the show with, came up with 10 more plots. Okay. Um, and then they were able to, to like basically cut it at 17 and say, we don't want to do anything more than 17. So the first um, seven episodes, I think, they're the seven episodes that he originally wanted to create, I think have more of a consistent arc. Um, they, if I remember correctly, and I may be wrong, people at home, if I remember, if you watch them in the production order, their use of drugs and mind control techniques on him increase steadily mm. throughout the show as they don't get what they want. Okay. And for me, the first time that I watched the show, not really, um, not really knowing the metaphorical uh, background for how the show was written, I just believed that the reason why the narrative consistency and logic of the episodes seemed to be breaking down was because the character had been so thoroughly manipulated at this point mm -hmm. that his his mind was not his own and that they might have broken him. You know, they, they talk frequently throughout the show about worrying about pushing him too far and mm -hmm. that he's a special target mm -hmm. and that you can't use the same methods you would use on other people because uh, they might break him. And... I think it's also hard talking about the the logical consistency of why they would need this information from him. We don't live during the Cold War. True. Um, this is England in 1968. The first thing that he assumes is that he's on the other side of the Iron Curtain and that this is all a ruse mm. to try to for the for the enemies of England to find out what he had learned that caused him to resign. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the implication, I think, and maybe I just internalized this, that he learned something so damning about the organization for which he worked mm -hmm. that he resigned. And knowing that he has his information but not knowing what it is is a huge liability. Mm -hmm. Where what if we kill what if we just kill him? Mm -hmm. Okay, but what if he gave the information to someone else? Mm -hmm. What if, you know, and there there are and that's I think a pretty common thing in like a Tom Clancy spy oh, novel yeah. from the seventies and eighties, where Definitely. like you know, so I, I for me that that makes more sense. I mean, some of the most confusing and wonderful parts of the show is the show's use of language. Yeah. Where there's a scene in the pilot episode where he walks into a shop and two characters are speaking German. And then as soon as they notice him, they both switch into English without yeah. missing a beat. Yeah. And, you know, those are wonderful. There's also episodes though, where they try to depict Roma language and you're yeah. like, what is that? <laughs> the Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if the, at the time people in the UK understood what Roma was. Is that um, Many Happy Returns? It's, it's both the woman they pair him with early on. I think maybe in the Chimes of Big Ben. Nadia, yeah. Oh, but, yes, yes. And then later on in... Um, I forget which episode it is, but he he runs into a, he make well we'll get to that, but he meets a a like a wagon of right. gypsies and they it's very similar. You're See, like, I didn't I didn't hear that as them, and maybe maybe that was intentionally supposed to be Roma. I uh, interpreted that much more as a Twin Peaks style. Oh, like it's words, but you can't understand them, oh, and like just another element to confuse him. That when he finally thinks he know, you know, he sees the freaking white cliffs of Dover, yeah. and then he climbs them, and he's in freaking <laughs> Eastern Europe. That's right. Uh, nothing, none of it makes any sense. What well, that's that might be my but you, um, my but favorite you, standalone episode. You just nailed to kind of summarize. You just nailed what is so gloriously wonderful about this show that either by accident happy or otherwise by intentionality or just by time passing you can you can rewatch these episodes and take something completely different away each time yes absolutely. you know i would imagine in 10 years from now i'll think of it very differently than i do now today yeah for sure i mean it's just the it's it it has this kind of because it's so out there and so avant-garde it has this crazy timeless quality to it 
Um, even with all the 60s motif, like you don't, that doesn't get in the way of it at all. No, for me, I mean, all of the, um, and I know all of this was incredibly intentional because I've, I've read a lot about it, but the costume design and the sets and the actors that were chosen and the dialogue, even when it's bizarre and even when it's confusing, it's charming. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. It's so charming. Yeah. Um, the one of the great choices that was made is that uh, is the relationship between number six and the different number twos. Mm -hmm. And with a lot of the number twos, I mean, he never takes an inherently uh, antagonistic uh, when he meets a new number You're two. You're right. Yeah. He's usually friendly and charming. Yeah. And, uh, that's his first instinct is to be positive. Yeah. Um, and to just never waver. And, you know, and it makes him such a compelling character that you can think that like, oh, they got to him and then, but they, they never can shake his desire to, uh, if, to if, just be an individual. If they remade this today, who would you cast as number six? Knowing all you just said needs to be part of it. Um, what actor could pull that off? Not Jim Caviezel, but we've already had him. Uh, I'd have to think. We'll put that as a challenge for next episode. Who could play? Both of us should come up with our pick. And we'll come back and, uh, and I don't want to make it all about like what could be today because the sure. show has itself, but it's kind of fun to think about like, oh my God, I almost, I watched the show thinking, man, they shouldn't have made Westworld. They should have rebooted this on HBO. Yeah, I, I guess. But it's one of those things where, um, the, uh, okay. I, I, it's my reason why I don't believe that, uh, you can possibly adapt, um, Watchmen. Mm -hmm. as a as a graphic novel because Watchmen exists as a whole and every single part of it supports the 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 entirety of what that project is mm -hmm. and when you remove something uh, there's enough weight from the rest of it that it all comes tumbling down okay um and so when i think you you when you adapt something you inherently have to cut elements of it and yeah. like um like the Zack Snyder Watchmen movie cut a lot of just the humor yeah. And yeah. um and and large ideas behind yeah. Watchmen. And it became sort of a shallow uh you know fairly faithful adaptation until the end. Um Yeah. Adapt but yeah, so like with the prisoner, I feel like those happy accidents are part of the show now and you can't recreate that unless you're doing something like Garth Marenghi. Like you can't yeah. you know what I mean? That's true. Um be without it becoming a parody. One of my favorite things about The Prisoner and that I can never tell is intentional or if it was a mistake is when he will enter a room and something is moving. And oh. you don't know if it was a set dresser or a uh, or a like a PA who was like, oh crap, and got out of the shot in a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. But there's a moment where uh, the sliding door in his in his um, apartment opens and it shows the bedroom and the lamp that's hanging above the room is just wobbling back oh, and forth, man. and it looks like somebody just turned it on and sprinted out of the room. Yeah, that there's like people in his house. Yeah, and you know that yeah. there are because yeah. they'll turn around and things that weren't there are there. Now. Well, and later on, people come into his house just all the time. Look yeah, they just <laughs> walk in. <laughs> They're just um, there hanging out all the time. And like that sort of stuff. Um, where you're like, was that an intentional thing? Because it, it lends itself so well, yeah. but maybe it wasn't intentional. Um, you know, uh, but you can rationalize it very well now. Yeah, and in a way that's not, you're not really even stretching. Like, well, that kind of makes sense. Like, the, he really found the perfect way to have his cake and eat it too creatively. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, he really did. And it's like it's such a beautiful thing to celebrate. So. We're going to get into all of this. We're going to get into each episode. The next time you hear from us, we're going to be reviewing the pilot, which is called Arrival. Yes. And it's probably the most straightforward yeah. episode of the show. That's true. Um, I think I, it has all of the stuff that you want in it, but it, but it lays, it plays out, I think, much more like a typical yeah. spy thing. You can see why the audience thought they were getting more <laughs> Danger Man. It's worth noting, too, that uh, b and in the finale, which we'll definitely get into later on, during the finale, apparently at that time, fans were so angry, they stormed Patrick McGowan's house and he had to flee the country for like yes. a month. Yeah, he said that he spent weeks <laughs> up in the mountains because the uh, response was so bad. And and now um, I can't imagine this as anything, you know, I, I like I I only know this show as a complete thing. So I mm -hmm. can't imagine anything else. Yeah. Um, but I was doing a little poking around online before we did this episode. And there is still a vocal message board community that is <laughs> of course capable, there is. that is capable of uh, applying all of their own logic to the, how the show ended and yeah. how uh, it actually it was really a much like, you know, they. 
it, it's almost disappointing because they seem dedicated to making the show much simpler than it than oh, it is. Oh, you can't do and that. And that, like, no, no, it was just a trick, or you know, I don't know. They're just trying to rationalize it into a into a, a narrative that they can understand when it's not. It's like a dream. It's like trying to tell someone about a dream. Yeah. It's like a trip to Casa Bonita. Like it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, as you talk about it, you're like, there was a magic show and we stood in line for an hour and three different people took our orders. Yeah. And the food was bad. And there was a kid jumping in our, into a into like a pool. And they're like, what? Wait, what was this? I, um, yeah, we should probably wrap up. But I was trying to explain to a coworker what the prisoner was. Yeah. And they were like, it sounds amazing and I can't wait to watch it. And I have no idea what you're talking about. Which is great because that is what we're here to do. Yes. We're here to, we're, because anytime you watch one of these episodes, the first thing, if you're like me, you want to do is I need desperately somebody to talk, to about, talk this. about this. Yeah. And I need, to, I just need he, to hear others points of view on this because like any great art, there are so many different positions you can yes. take and all of them are pretty damn valid. Um, so we're going to get into all the episodes. We're not going to just recap the episodes. No. That's There's plenty of other shows that do that. We're going to talk about the episode, but get into the symbolism, get into some like, you know, some, some gossip and production details that you might not know. Um, talk about in, in Charles may see an episode one way. I may see it completely differently, um, which will be fun to chat about too. We may have some episodes where we just do live commentaries. I don't sure. know. Cause there's yep. some that are really set up for that. Um, I'm thinking the one where it's just purely silent for like half of it, if not oh, most yeah. of it. Um, so we're going to have a lot of that kind of going on. So if, if you've ever wanted to get into the prisoner, um, now's the time. Keep us handy. You know, we'll be your, your friends along for the journey. We'll be your, vill- your your fellow village idiots. Yes, absolutely. As it were. Tune in for episode one. We'll be back uh, with that, and we'll get into the, the normal group of things. So Great. Be seeing you, Charles. Be seeing you, David. Uh-huh.